in Palm Bay. We are starting a brand new book tonight. So if you ever wanted to join with us, this is your chance. Uh, we're starting the book of Genesis. We're going to be diving into the book of Genesis. We go verse by verse very deeply and slowly through it. And uh, we're, I'm excited about that. So if you're interested in joining us tonight, 7 o'clock, First Baptist in the Atlantic in the Fellowship Hall, park in the back, and the doors will be open. Wednesday night, the exact same study is available on uh, at LifePoint in Palm Bay in the Sanctuary. All right? Now, if you remember, we've been going through the series on the principles of a God-centered church. And if you've been following along, you'll notice that in the book, the next principle we're going to cover, it, or supposed to cover, is no volunteers, only the call. But we're going to deal with that next Tuesday when I come back. I'm flip-flopping because I really feel like God wants us to deal with the principle five before we get to principle number four uh, for, for his purposes in our study. What we're going to be looking at today is the fact that God designed the church to do the work, not just the pastors. And so that's where we're going to spend some time. And I'm going to go into a lot of detail today from the scriptures and show you where we got off track. But unfortunately, and as in many of our churches, the mindset in the church is that the pastors are the ones who are supposed to be doing the work of the ministry Amen. and not the people. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. If, if, if I were to ask you this question, whose responsibility is it to build up the body of Christ? Most of us would say the pastor, correct? Someone need to be saved? Call the pastor. Someone sick? Call the pastor. And we've got this wrong mentality. I'm going to show you in a little bit from the Scriptures where we got off, actually. And it's not actually from the Scriptures as much as from a comma that should never have been there. And I'll get to that in just a little bit. But turn in your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 11 through 16. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. Paul continues in where he's dealing with here. And he says, And he, this is God, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning and by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every, every joint with which it's equipped, when each part is working properly, mm -hmm. it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Look closely at this passage. God gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints to do the work of the ministry. Amen. And when the, each part does its part, the body is built up. But unfortunately, over the years, we've gone away from God's design and we've expected the pastor to do the work of the ministry. Amen. And we judge whether or not he's doing a good enough job. Actually, I don't know if you know this or not, but Jesus took it from a singular model and made it a wide model. In John chapter 16, verse 7, he says this. He says, it's good for you that I'm going away. Because if I go away, then the Holy Spirit can come. The Comforter can come. In other words, Jesus said, right now, you guys have got to stand in line to spend time with me. Zacchaeus has got to climb a tree to be able to even see me. The woman with the issue of blood has got to push through a crowd to even be able to touch me. But when I go away, then I can come back and I'll be with you all. He had already told them in John 14 that when the Holy Spirit comes, He's going to be with all of them and in them. And so Jesus took it from a single model and He turned it into a wide model. Yeah. I'll be with you all. Amen. What we've done is we've taken it from the wide model where the Holy Spirit's in all of us and wanting to do His work through all of us and turned it back to a single model. Someone need to be saved? Call the pastor. Someone sick? Call the pastor. And I want to show you in the Scriptures here that God designed the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. Some people think there are five-fold ministry uh, offices. I think it's four. I think in the Greek, the pastor-teacher is combined. Amen. But he designed them to do the to teach you all to do the work of the ministry, and then as the context shows us, the body builds itself up as each part does its work. So, where did we get off track? How did we, for so long, expect the pastor to do the work of the ministry? Well, 
actually, like I hinted at at the beginning, it goes back to a comma in the King James translation. I don't know how many of you have a King James translation on you, but I'm going to pull up the King James translation on my phone here and read to you this passage, and I want you to listen closely. Now understand that the, the punctuations are not inspired. The original text doesn't have punctuation. In the Hebrew and the Greek, there's no punctuation. But the translators would have to know, well, this is where the sentence ends, and this is where the sentence begins, and so on. And the commas aren't inspired. Listen closely. And he gave some, gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, comma, for the work of the ministry, comma, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now that's the building up of the body of Christ. Listen closely again to that section. He gave these four different types of guys, these offices, for the perfecting of the saints, comma, for the work of the ministry, comma, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So in the way that it's written, it reads like the edifying of the, of the body, perfecting of the saints, and the work of the ministry is all their responsibility. You see it? He gave these guys for the perfecting of the, uh, edif the, perfecting of the saints, work of the ministry, edifying of the body. Listen closely. Every single English translation since the, new, since the King James, including the New King James, has removed the comma between perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. You see it? If you look at your Bible, you'll notice here in, in, even in the ESV, he gave the apostles, the prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. There's no equipping of the saints, comma, work of the ministry, comma. Now all of a sudden the work of the ministry becomes whose job? The saints. Do you see it? Mm -hmm. The King James translation, by the way, is probably where we got off. And now, I'm not bashing the King James, but that comma should never have been put there. Because in the context, even, if I were to keep reading to you in the King James, it clearly says around verse 16 that the body edifies itself as each part does its job. The context shows that all along, it should never have been the pastor's job to do the work of the ministry. The pastors are actually supposed to be equipping the church to do the work of the ministry. Peter even himself in 1 Peter 5 said that we're to be examples to the flock. I'm not saying pastors should never visit somebody or pastors should never do any of the work of the ministry. What I'm saying is it should have never been expected that the pastor would be the person that does it. The pastors are supposed to be equipping you to do it. Remember back when the early church started to grow so much and they had a problem with the daily distribution of the food in Acts 6? And how they went to the pastors, if you will, and they said, hey, we got a problem. And this is what they said. They said it wouldn't be right for us to neglect the ministry we've been given mm -hmm. of prayer and study of the Word and feeding of the Word to wait on tables. Mm -hmm. You guys choose some men full of the Spirit and wisdom, and you hand this responsibility over to them. Mm -hmm. In other words, they were wise enough to say, we're going to get derailed from what God wants us to be doing, which is feeding the Word teaching the Word, prayer, spiritual leadership, to have to take care of these other things. Let me tell you how I came about learning this principle and put it in the book. Years ago when I was pastor at First Baptist in the Atlantic, the church was exploding in growth. The budget had gone from 300000 to $1.2 million. Attendance had gone from about 100 folks to almost 600. Things were going and blowing, and the church property had been fixed. We got the, the pews are packed. Our budget's doing great. If you had asked anybody how things were going, they would have said, these are the best years of our, of our church's history. Mm. But nobody had any idea, not even my wife and my kids, how absolutely done I was. Mm. Mm. I was absolutely worn out to the point. I came home one night, which was very common. My wife and kids are already in bed. And I got home dark from... Who knows whether the latest counseling session or whatever it was that was expected of me. And I sat in my chair in my living room looking out through our sliding glass doors to our pool. And I literally wanted to go lay down in the bottom of the pool. I didn't want to float on top. I literally sat there thinking it would be so much easier just to go get in the pool, lay in the bottom, take one deep breath and be done. God got a hold of me that night. He said, Jim, you tired? I said, oh, I'm tired. Mm -hmm. He said, you burn out? Oh, I'm burn out. Mm -hmm. Then he asked me this question. He said, why are you burn out? Does the Holy Spirit ever run out? Mm -hmm. 
I said, no, you promised the rivers of living water that I'd never thirst again. He said, then why are you burnt out? And I started to realize that I was burnt out because I was doing in my own strength what he had never asked me to do. You see, one of the things I prided myself as being, as I come into a church as a new pastor, I would come in and I would tell him, look, we're going to stop doing it how it's always been done. We're going to lay everything flat. We're going to rebuild from the ground up. Biblically. We're going to look at the scriptures and we're going to rebuild. Because the churches that God called me to pastor all around the country, He brought me in when they were about to die. And they pretty much were ready for whatever. And so I'd come in and I'd say, okay, new sheriff in town, we're going to just start over. We're not going to continue as it was. What does the scripture say? Let's rebuild it from the ground up. And that's what we did. But God got a hold of me that night. He said, you've rebuilt everything in this church from the ground up scripturally except what you do. You're pastoring like it's always been done. Here you say, stop doing it the way it's always been done. Why don't you do a Bible study to find out what the pastor's job is actually supposed to be? And I don't have time to get into that, but it was a two-year study that God took me on in the journey. And he began to open my eyes to some things. Those of you who have been in church life long enough, you've probably seen a few pastors come and go. Have you ever noticed that churches tend to bring in the next pastor and he has the gifts the previous guy didn't have? Mm. I mean, like say, say for example, you've got, an, you've got a prophet for a pastor. You're going to have a wonderful prophet, pastor, who's gifted to preach the Word of God and it applies to what's going on in the day and they're able to take the Scriptures and just, man, it comes alive. And your church is going to grow if you have a prophet as a pastor. But over time, you're going to hear things like this. I love brother so-and-so. Man, I've never learned as much as I've ever learned under his preaching. He's a powerful preacher of the Word of God. He just doesn't visit enough. <laughs> He's not approachable. And eventually, after a while, because the, pa the church will expect the pastor to be all four of these, and he's only one, he gave some to be apostles, mm. some to be prophets, mm -hmm. some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. Because the church expects one guy to be all of that, after a while, they're going to start making him a little uncomfortable because they're going to start grumbling because he ain't doing everything that they expect him to do. And after a while, you're going to get a new pastor come in because that one's going to find it a little easier to go somewhere else. And the new guy they're going to bring in, he's going to have the gifts the previous guy did. We love brother so-and-so, but he didn't visit enough. He wasn't approachable. We need more of a shepherd. We need more of a pastor than a preacher. And you know what? You're going to bring in a guy with the gifts that the guy, previous guy didn't have. and He's going to do his best, man. He's going to kiss all the babies, shake all the hands. And after a while, you're going to hear this. I love brother so-and-so. He was there when mama died. He's a wonderful man. He listens. I'm just not getting fed. You been there? You might even have an evangelist as a pastor. Man, people are getting saved. Left and right, your baptism is... Baptistry's getting filled all the time, and then after a while you're going to hear, I think the pastor cared more about me when I was lost. Mm. <laughs> Duh. He's been wired by God mm. to be an evangelist. Mm. Some are apostles. By the way, I don't think there's any more capital A apostles where they're taught by Jesus face to face or have the signs and wonders, but I believe the Bible still uses, God says in the Scriptures, He's still using apostles. The word means sent one. Mm. There are those of us who are called to equip the church on a traveling ministry, you're looking at one. I'm never going to put that on my business card, Apostle Jim Johnson, because it'll freak people out. But I'm gifted by God to travel and to go to places and go into places where they don't even know who I am. But He uses me to equip the church on a traveling ministry. If you were to come to me and say, Jim, we're going to give you a pastorate of a church in one place. You can be there 50 years. No one will give you any trouble. That doesn't sound like prison to me. I've been wired by God to be on the move. God used me as a pastor, and I pastor churches. But usually right around five years, once the church got healthy, I started to get antsy because I've been wired to go help somebody else. And I came to realize God had called me in an apostle, small a, travel type of ministry to equip the church. But you know what? It's not just y'all's fault. It's our fault too as pastors. We show up at the interview process, and they put together a profile of Superman. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure I can tell you how your church goes about finding out what they want for a pastor. They're going to put out a survey. What would you like our next pastor to be? What would you like his gifts to be? 
And someone else to put in there, well, he needs to be a preacher of the word. Okay, we'll put that on there. He needs to be a shepherd and care for people. We'll put that on there too. Oh, he also needs to have the ability to lead people to Jesus and teach us how to lead people to Jesus. Okay, we'll put that on there. Oh, he's got to have administrative abilities. I mean, he's going to kind of supervise the staff and make sure the copier's working and all that kind of stuff. And, and put, we put together, you, you, if everybody has an opinion what they think the pastor should be, and you put together a pastor profile. We're looking for a man of God who preaches the word of God, who's got a shepherd's heart, who's got an evangelistic zeal, he's got administrative abilities, he's a counselor, boom, boom, boom. And we show up at the interview and we read that profile, which is no, there's no human being besides Jesus that could do that. And God never designed one person to do all that. We show up at the interview and we say, well, I'm your guy. And they say, good, because the last bomb sure wasn't. He was lacking in certain areas. And we get in there, and after a while you're going to find out we're lacking in some of those areas too. Mm. Did you ever notice that God never designed one person to be the pastor of the church? Mm. Mm -hmm. Actually, in Acts chapter 13, in the church in Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. All through the scriptures we see that there's supposed to be a group of elders. Mm -hmm. Some of them are lay elders. Some are professional, if you will, paid elders. <clears throat> That's why the Bible says in 1 Timothy 5.17, the elders, plural, leadership in your church who serve the body well, are worthy of double honor, especially those whose role is preaching and teaching. There are elders, spiritual leaders. The word elder could be translated also pastor, overseer. They're all interchangeable. Those who are supposed to be the shepherds and the leaders in the church spiritually, some are preacher, teachers, some aren't. But God never designed one guy to be the pastor. If I were to ask you, who was the pastor of the church in Philippi, what would you say? No, the right answer is there wasn't a pastor of the church in Philippi. There were pastors. There were leaders in the church in Philippi. I could go on and list names for you, but it wouldn't do you any good. But let me just say this to you. There, we, there was no one pastor of the church in Corinth. There was no one pastor of the church in Colossae. There was no, we try to make James the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. But honestly, there was always a leadership. Paul even himself said that when he went to Jerusalem, he went to go meet with the leaders. There should always be a plurality of leadership in our church. I think there needs to be a senior elder, a senior pastor, but you all should never expect one person to be all of that. And we actually hinder the work of God when we expect the pastor to do the work of the ministry. Do you know, I put it in my notes this way, we hinder... God's work when we expect someone whom God hasn't planned on doing the work and hasn't gifted to do the work to do the work. Let me read that to you again. We hinder God's work when we expect someone whom God hasn't planned on doing the work and hasn't gifted to do the work to do the work. Now I'm going to be honest with you guys. In all my years of teaching these principles around the country, this one has given people the most of a bellyache. I'll share with churches, and they know I'm saying it's true, but they have a hard time with it. You know why? Because it's all you've ever known, and all of y'all want that special touch from the senior pastor. There could be other pastors in your church, but if an associate comes by, or a deacon comes by, or somebody else comes by, you kind of feel a little bit slighted. Because you want the senior pastor to come look after you. By the way, if that's your mindset, you've already predetermined the size of your church. Do you know that God can only... Well, let's just put it this way. An, one individual could only be that to only so many people without killing themselves or neglecting their family, which unfortunately happens a lot in ministry. Years ago when I was pastor first in the Atlantic and God began to teach me some of this stuff and I was starting to teach the church, a couple of things happened. One was this, uh, I went and visited this guy in the hospital because it was my job. Got to be honest with you, it never was something I loved because I'm a preacher. And sometimes you can't really preach when someone's in the hospital. I went to visit this guy and he said to me, he said, Pastor, would you do me a favor? I said, what's that? He said, would you not visit me? 
<laughs> I can be honest with you, inside I'm leaping. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, why? He goes, you're not good at it. <laughs> he goes, when someone else comes, it, it, feels, it feels right. It's comfortable. Their encouragement. It just feels forced when you're here. It feels awkward. I know you're gifted at other stuff. You, I know you're supposed to be doing other things. Don't come see me anymore. I wanted to kiss this guy on the mouth. I didn't even know what he had or what was he in there for. I just, I, I wanted to get him out of the hospital bed and parade him around the church. Listen to him. But I was doing something that was expected of me even though I wasn't really gifted. And that doesn't mean I would never go visit somebody, but there's an expectation that the senior pastor has to be there too. Mm -hmm. Years ago, again, I was teaching this, and after two years of teaching this to my last church I pastored, a couple of older ladies came up to me after church, and they said, can we talk to you? And I said, sure. They said, we need to ask for your forgiveness. I said, what for? She said, well, one of them said, well, we should have never expected you to always be visiting us or do all our surgeries and all this stuff. We should have never expected you to always be checking after all of us. Would you please forgive us? I said, ladies, it's forgiven. Mm -hmm. Then they leaned in and looked around and they said, but you're still going to come see <laughs> us, right? <laughs> just imagine, guys, just imagine that you have raised your child... He's now 50, 60, 70, maybe even 80 years old. And you've said to your child, you don't have to make your bed. Mom and dad will take care of that. Mm -hmm. You don't have to cut the grass. Mom and dad will take care of that. You don't have to do the dishes. Mom and dad will take care of that. And then about 80, say 70 years old, you sit Junior down in the kitchen and you say, Junior, your mom and I just found a comma that shouldn't have been there. <laughs> You're going to have to make your own bed. You're going to have to cut the grass. You're going to have to help with the dishes. How do you think Junior's going to react? It's not my job. Yeah. Listen, I know how this feels to some of you. But if I'm going to be faithful to the Scriptures, and if you want your pastors to flourish, mm. and their families not to suffer, you need to understand that some are apostles. Mm -hmm. Some are prophets. Some are evangelists. Some are shepherds and teachers. For the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. Let me go back to this passage. Listen to what's going to happen to your church. If you actually let God design the leadership the way he's got in mind, and you don't expect one guy to be the voice, <laughs> to equip the saints, verse 12, for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning and by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Do you realize... That if you keep going with the one guy model, your church is going to keep changing its theology every single time you get a new pastor. Mm -hmm. You're going to get tossed to and fro by the latest doctrine of the latest guy that's come in. And you're not going to have a plurality of leadership that actually together seeks the will of the Lord and the wisdom of a multitude of counselors. Do you realize that we have been having this happen to our churches over and over? Because the church is going to take on the personality of whatever the new pastor is. And then everybody's just going to follow him. And a lot of guys like that. A lot of guys that come in as pastor of the church like the fact that their name's on the sign. Like the fact that their name's on the bus. Like the fact that that's pastor so-and-so's church. Even though it's the Lord's church. And yet, if you understand that God's designed a plurality of leadership to oversee the body... It's going to keep that stuff from happening. Paul said in Acts chapter 20, verses uh, 32 and following, no, 28 through 32, he said, I know that after I leave, <laughs> savage wolves are going to come in. 
and not sparing a whole flock, come in from among your number to lead disciples away after themselves. Mm -hmm. But you know what? If you understand that he gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, and there should be that kind of mixture of leadership in your churches, it's going to keep that from happening. I had a young man who was a youth pastor who worked with me when I was pastor at First Baptist Atlantic. We had four pastors on staff, and I loved the plurality that we had there. And I actually would run my messages and sermon series by, and we'd talk it all through, and we'd work on how it was all going to tie together with all of the ministries. But this one young man, and I actually saw him yesterday. I was at a funeral in Brandon, Florida yesterday. And while I was at this funeral, not knowing this young man was going to be there, he's now a professor at, at a college over, over on the west side of the Florida. He actually showed up at this funeral. When I saw him, I hugged his neck, and we caught up. Hadn't seen him in a while. But you know what my nickname was for him when he and I worked together? I called him the Minister of Contradiction. <laughs> Because I would say things, and he goes, I don't see it that way. And I'd say, Dan, how come every time I say something, you're going to look at it the opposite? He said, because I'm wired that way, and we need the balance. And I look back over the years, and I thank God for my minister of contradiction. I thank God for him, because you know what? He helped me see things in a way I had never looked at them. It's really easy to be seen your pastor and to think that you see it all the best. But I had little wonderful bumps in my road on staff with me. And it was a good thing. Because you know what? I'm going to tell you something. I don't have it all figured out. I don't know it all. And God says we need each other. Yes, sir. Have you ever noticed how many people Paul put together with him in ministry? Mm -hmm. He didn't do it on his own. Mm -hmm. He was forever bringing people along, having them work with him, wrestling with it through. He and Barnabas even had to wrestle a little bit, work things through over time. Folks, your church will be better off when you have more than one that's responsible for the spiritual leadership of your church. And when you stop expecting that individual to be doing the work of the ministry, but you all, we're going to deal with this next week, how there's no volunteers, only the called. I'm going to show you in Scripture, there's no such thing as volunteering. Mm -hmm. But that God not only, we looked, last time I was together with you, back on March 26th, we looked at how God already has the plan to use His. I'm going to show you scripturally how God's already chosen whom He wants to do each job. Mm -hmm. He only, not only knows what He wants to do, He's already chosen who. And we're going to try to wrestle with that next week. But let me just close by saying this. We also miss out on the power of God when we expect someone whom God hasn't chosen to do the work to do the work. Because he's only going to empower the one he has called to do it. We'll deal with that no more next week. But I want to just close with this story. While God was teaching me this principle, and I was pastor still at First Baptist in the Atlantic, we had a young man get saved in our church. You're going to get a kick out of this, Gary. The guy that led him to the Lord, his name was Gary Tuttle. <laughs> For years, all of us that know Gary Tuggle have gotten Gary Tuttle and Gary Tuggle's names mixed up. Gary Tuttle led this young man to the Lord. He was over dating his daughter, and while this young man was over his house dating his daughter, Gary sat down with him and led him to the Lord. He's an evangelist. Gary just was a, an evangelist. Mm -hmm. Well, this young man that got saved, his name was Tim. He was from the streets. He was from the drug crowd. He actually had dreadlocks and piercings. And he didn't really look like First Baptist in the Atlantic. <laughs> but you know what was so cool? When he got saved and came to be a part of our church, our church just loved on him. And actually, when he got baptized, probably was the first bath he had had in a long time. <laughs> 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 Two months after Tim got saved, he died. Ooh, wow. He had a seizure and he was gone. And there was now time to do Tim's funeral. Now, let me give you a little backstory. 
At this time, as you know, I told you I was a workaholic and I was ignoring my family. There was a family in the church who saw this. They came to me and they gave me, for me and my wife and our kids, passes to Walt Disney World. The kind that you can go any day of the year, 10% off, free parking. They said, Jim, you are not spending enough time with your family. We have bought you these passes so that you have to go use them and take your kids to Disney. Now, my wife and I were so excited about this gift, we actually held it until Christmas morning, and we sat down on Christmas morning, gave the gift, and we explained to each of our kids, because of this wonderful gift, we are going to let you choose on your birthday, we're going to go other days, but on your birthday, you are king or queen for the day, and you get to pick what park we go to, and it's a park hopper pass. You can pick what parks. You get to pick what we ride next. You get to pick where we eat. On your birthday, you are king or queen for the day, and everybody else in the family has to follow you around. You're in charge. Well, our oldest daughter, Nicole, at this time was probably about eight. Her birthday was January 12th. Then the next daughter, Elise, her birthday's April 2nd. Our boy, AJ, at the time, only like two or three years old, his birthday's not till November. <laughs> and he's been dreaming of this day when he gets to tell everybody in the family where to go. <laughs> we had a list on the fridge that he, because he couldn't write and read, but he'd come out and say, Mom, I changed my mind. We're going to ride this, and then we're going to ride this. And she would change the list. All year he's been planning for his birthday. Mm. Well, guess what? Tim dies in November, and his funeral is on my son AJ's birthday. And I have a decision to make. Am I going to preach the funeral, or am I going to keep my promise to my son? Well, of course... These are passes that you can go any day. You can take them the day before, the day after. But the Holy Spirit was speaking to me and he said, it's time your kids can't realize they came before the church. Yes. Lord, you're going to get me fired. <laughs> he said, you do what I tell you. You promised your son that day. You don't preach the funeral. You have someone else do it. Well, of course, my brain starts thinking about which of the other pastors. There's four pastors on staff. God said, no. You've been teaching them that you're equipping them to do the work of the ministry. I want Gary Tuttle to preach the funeral. So I called Gary. I said, Gary, let me give you the whole story. And God's telling me you're supposed to preach it. He said, you've taught us, Pastor, to pray before we say yes or no. Can I pray about this? I said, sure, go ahead. He calls the next day. He said, I'm supposed to do it. But can I do it how I feel like? I'm supposed to do it, not how you would do it? I said, of course. He said, do we still have Tim's baptism video? I said, yeah, why? Now, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, back then, if anybody got saved, we had them come into a, video, a, a recording room and make a video of their testimony. They would, they would say, hi, my name's Tim, and let me tell you how I got saved, and how mm -hmm. Jesus saved me. And they'd give their testimony. And then on the Sunday that they got baptized, before they got in the water, the screen came down in front of the baptism, baptistry, and, and uh, their video would play, Big as Life. Hi, my name's Tim, and they would tell their testimony. Then the screen would go up, and they'd come into the water, and we'd baptize. He goes, do we still have Tim's baptism video? I want him to preach at his own funeral. I thought, man, that's a great idea. So I said, yeah, we, we got that for him. And he goes, also, he goes, I don't want to call it a funeral. I want to call it a memorial service. And I want to go and invite all the kids from the drug streets mm. of Melbourne. And he did. You know how a band will have a concert and they'll make a homemade poster, you know, and they put them up everywhere? They made the picture of Tim. These flyers that they set up all over the streets of Melbourne. Hey, memorial service for Tim at First Baptist in the Atlantic on such and such a day. I got up that Sunday before and explained to the church that I wasn't going to be preaching the funeral, but Gary was going to do it. Fully expecting people to be upset with me. You know what happened next? Surprise. I got a standing ovation. Over 500 people in that sanctuary stood up and gave me an applaud because I chose my son mm -hmm. over the work of the church. Let me say something to you pastors. Sometimes mm -hmm. stuff we think people are thinking, they're not even thinking. 
I had a lady come to me after and she said, you did more good for this church by choosing your son today over us. Mm. And by the way, I'm still reaping the benefits. That kid that was two to three years old that we took to Disney on his birthday is now Never 25 Never and walking with the Lord. By the way, the whole day I'm wondering what's going on during the funeral. When it's over, I call Gary. How'd it go? He said eight people got saved. Mm. Oh, wow. I got mad. <laughs> I've never had eight people get saved when I preached the funeral. <laughs> the funeral director called me. He said, you know I've done a bunch of funerals. Today was the first time I heard the gospel. Mm. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> Professional minister here. I've been to seminary. I got the reverend. What's going on? He said, when you get up there and say it, you're getting paid to say it. Mm. It loses its power. <clears throat> when Gary got up and said it, Come on. I was listening. Do you realize how much we're crippling the work of the ministry? Mm. By expecting the professional ministers to do the work? That was never God's design. Mm. I can't wait till next week. Come back next week. I'm going to show you from Scripture. God's already chosen what He's got for you to do, and He's already... He's going to reveal it to you, but there's no volunteering. There's no volunteering. I'm going to talk to you next week about getting rid of the nominating committee. Uh -oh. But we'll yeah. jump over that hurdle <laughs> yeah. next week. I love you guys. Thanks for coming. See you next time.